I see this lady and she starts looking straight into my eyes and starts walking towards me. And I'm like, all right, do I know this person? Why are they walking towards me, like looking dead in my eyes? It's kind of weird and awkward, right? Beautiful person. And, uh, and comes right up to me, very, very close to me and says, who are you? And I'm like, what, who are you? Like, what, what kind of question is that to a random stranger on the street? Uh, and she goes, no, who are you? I was like, I don't know, maybe she knows me from somewhere. I have no idea. So I'm like, well, my name is Ajit and, uh, you know, that's who I am. Like, no, but who are you? And I was like, I don't know, this lady is really obsessed with me or something. I was like, I'm Ajit, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm CEO of Mind Valley. And, and she goes again, no, who are you? Mm -hmm. and, and I really didn't have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I realized, is my identity just being the CEO of Mind Valley? Like, is that all I am? Is that all I do? Is that who I am becoming more and more of? Mm -hmm. Is that really who I am? Because I couldn't answer that question beyond that. Mm -hmm. and that another episode of Creating Powerful Impact. I'm your host, Shay Wheat, founder of Grace and Ease Productions, where we support entrepreneurs just like you with event-based marketing and sales strategies, allowing you to build your authority, your credibility, and your visibility in your industry. And today's guest is someone that I am so stoked to have on with us because over the past decade, our guest has not only been the former CEO of Mind Valley, he's the current co-founder of Evercoach, Dharma Coaching Institute, and Global Grit. He is the host of Master Coaching with Ajit, which happens to be one of the fastest growing podcasts for self-coaches and professional coaches. But when he's done with all of that for the day, I love that he just like leaves it all behind to be fully present with his family and with himself. Please help me welcome him to Creating Powerful Impact Stage. How are you? Oh, thank you for inviting me, Shay. That was a wonderful introduction. I am doing fantastic. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so thrilled for you to be here because we like officially, officially met in a mastermind group that we're both in. And I think that day we were actually both teaching on stage. But how I personally originally heard about you was through my client, Lisa Nichols. Um, and all the work that she had done with Mind Valley, right? Cool. Yeah, I was just talking to Lisa yesterday. Were you? Yesterday, yeah, yeah. I love that. Like, she's the type of person who she is off stage and on stage is the same. Yeah. And you know, you see some coaches, speakers, experts out there that it's totally different, but she is the same person on and off stage. And how you feel her is just how she treats her team, which I love. Yeah. But speaking of Mind Valley. Um, I think I heard somewhere that you were actually running Mind Valley when you were in your early 30s. Yes. So I started with Mind Valley when I was 24 or something. I started with the company as an intern. And at that time, Mind Valley was not the Mind Valley you know. Mind Valley was a, almost like an agency, you can say, to overly simplify it. It wasn't really an agency, but a small publisher, if I may. And we would have different websites and different products with different leaders in the industry. And that's kind of how we operate as a business. And um, it, was, it was growing, but it was a small enterprise. We were about 10 people in the company. I would say maybe 12 at that time, uh, working out of a house. We didn't even have a proper office, really. Um, that's when I joined the company. And uh, I, I was able to work with the company really deeply, really quickly. Uh, I was able to rise on the ranks really quickly. And in about six years, I went from being an intern in the company to being the CEO of the company. I was CEO of the company late 2013 until 2015. So, so I did about a year and a half. And in that, in that time, I had some personal crisis, which is really why I kind of decided not to step down from the position because while I was being the CEO of Mind Valley was my dream at the time. And that was something that I was so excited for every day of my life. I had a health crisis, I had relationship crisis, I had friendship crisis, I was really lonely. And I realized that I have gone to the top of my, top of my career while ignoring everything else in my life. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I had a personal life crisis, which uh, then had to, uh, for which reasons I kind of stepped down as the CEO of the company and decided to build something of my own. Um, more in congruence with building a life the way I want to live um, and and also having a business that is impactful and meaningful that gave birth to have a coach of course which now by the way has been merged into Mind Valley and it's called Mind Valley Coach. Well and that's just very kind of full circle then isn't it? Yeah, it Coming is, back yes. together. So let, let's dive into that for a second because I know a lot of our listeners are you know multiple six seven figure business owners and they're in the grind and they're pushing and they're getting the hustle on. 
Um, can you speak to now that you've done essentially sounds like something similar and changed and morphed it into something now where you get to spend time with your family and have a family and do all of those things. What is it like? Was there any warning signs before you got sick? Um, that if you see it now and should it start to creep up again, you could be like, Ooh, I need to adjust this or. Um, I wouldn't say that I saw warning signs. I kind of woke up to them. It was more of a spiritual story. You can say in a way, um, it was one of the fine evenings. Uh, I was the CEO of the company. It was, I think December, 2014. Uh, it was December, 2014. We were doing the new year's Eve in Malaysia. I decided to stay back. Uh, I had a partner at the time that we were not really connected to so much anymore, uh, because she wanted a different life. I wanted a different life. I'm. I love working. I enjoy creating. I'm I'm somebody who wants to be in the world doing things. And she was somebody who wanted to live more of a retired life, if I may say it that way. And so our, our value system wasn't really a match. And so just I was just like, all right, I don't want to do New Year's in, you know, a remote place where, you know, you're not really interacting with the world. I want to be in Malaysia where my team was, my friends were. And so I was celebrating New Year's Eve with with a bunch of them. And uh, New, the, the New Year's Eve in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia is kind of like New York, uh, much smaller, but kind of like New York, uh, where there's fireworks and the people on the street and everybody's going happy, happy New Year, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I was on the street waiting for the fireworks to go off. And uh, I, I, I realized that none of my friends are around me. They might have gotten stepped away somewhere or somehow I got by myself. And I see this uh, person dressed really weirdly in a ceremonial garb almost across me all white and i was like all right that's kind of a weird thing to wear on a uh, new year's eve in malaysia you know everybody was dressed in suits and dressed nines not ceremonially but more like in the party mode um and so uh i see this lady and she starts looking straight into my eyes and starts walking towards me and i'm like all right do i know this person why they're walking towards me like looking dead in my eyes it's kind of weird and awkward right beautiful person and uh, and comes right up to me very very close to me and says who are you and i'm like what who are you like what, what kind of question is that to a random stranger on the street uh and she goes no who are you i was like I don't know, maybe she knows me from somewhere. I have no idea. So I'm like, well, my name is Ajit and, uh, you know, that's who I am. Like, no, but who are you? And I was like, I don't know, this lady is really obsessed with me or something. I was like, I'm Ajit, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm I, CEO of Mind Valley. And and she goes again, no, who are you? Mm -hmm. And and I really didn't have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I realized, is my identity just being the CEO of Mind Valley? Like, is that all I am? Is that all I do? Is that who... I am becoming more and more of, mm -hmm. is that really who I am? Because I couldn't answer that question beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of started this questioning journey for within me to ask, who am I really? And, and, and I found that I had fallen so much in love with my career that I'd forgotten that I'm here to live a life and not to just build a career. Career is a part of life. It's not the life. It has all the other elements too. What about love? What about service? What about really taking care of people around you? What about parents? What about kids? What about friends? What about health? What about adventure? What about, you know, all of those different things. And that set me off on a path where I got more and more curious about what have I done with my life in at that point of time. And that led me to kind of say, okay, I think I need to quit the one thing to be able to restart and refine who I am and what I want to create in this world and how I want to live my life uh, in that context and container. And that led me down the pathway of creating what I created. But to address the question that you have uh, of when there are entrepreneurs or individuals that are listening to this conversation going, well, I work all the time. Uh, I, I have a very clear and present message for anybody that works all the time is if you're working all the time, it's more likely that you're lying to yourself than you're working all the time. Mm -hmm. Because working all the time means you're, you're trying to run away from something that is empty in you or there's a hole in you that you're trying to fill. And for that reason, you're telling yourself story that you're working all the time. Most people that I've found, that when they say they are working all the time, they're at a desk all the time. They're not actually working. Right. When you work, you probably cannot do more than about three or four hours of real hard work. 
After that, you're tired, exhausted, and non-productive. You tell yourself this beautiful story, oh, I'm working, I'm working, because it looks cool, and you sound cool, you're not working. So it's a great lie that we tell ourselves, uh, and it's a great lie that makes us feel happy and gets us to wear this badge of honor of how hardworking we are. I've yeah. tested this with people who apparently work eight, 10 hours a day. They can do their work in three to four hours. After that, they're just wasting time. Wow, yeah. And so then you're... So do you feel it, it's more of a mindset piece that it's like, I feel that I have to say that I'm working all the time and be at my desk and act like I'm doing things versus if I really focused on the revenue producing or the things that only I can do and do that in three to four hours and then spend the rest of my time doing other things that would fill me up is... Is there it two parts the mindset? It. Is it the the cultural construct that we need to stay within that people are stuck there or what? It's a cultural contract, uh, cultural container. Uh, and secondly, it's it's an escape mechanism. And thirdly is our inability to build a skill set. Mm -hmm. So first, I the cu cultural context. We grew up, most of us that are in at least in our age bracket is in that 30s, 40s, 50s. If we grew up in a world where everybody said hard work, hard work, that's how you build a business. Yeah. Yes, for the first two years, for the first three years, I totally get it. But if you were any good at what you did in the first three years, you got a slightly, you got slightly successful. And you got slightly successful, what you chose to do at that point is to say hard work, I'm gonna sacrifice everything because mm, look, this is a great story to tell. My children, look, I work so hard for you. That's bullshit, they didn't ask you to do it. You're doing this to them just because your father did it to you or your mother did it to you. It's, it's a lie. What you should have done at that time is to hire somebody. So you didn't have to work 10 hour days, but you chose not to because it doesn't make a classy story. It doesn't make a beautiful story that you get to tell your friends, you know, I'm working all the time and my wife or I'm working all the time and my husband doesn't really do anything. Stop bullshitting yourself. This is a great folk horror that we Folk hall? Is that, is that what it's called, right? You know, the story of the past, you know, like what, what people say that, that, oh, you need to work so hard. No, that used to be when we were chopping wood or farming. You don't have to work that hard. AI does half of your work or can get you to do it. You yeah. can cut four or five hours of your day just right now, for, if not of the day of the week for sure, five hours of your week just by using AI. But you wouldn't, and most people don't. Because then what, what they would, do what with their time, time, right? because what are they gonna do with their time? And they, they're scared of having space time, right? Because when you have time, what do you do with it? It's, it's then you have to go work out. You have to eat right. You mm -hmm. have to spend time with your partner. You have to spend time with your kids and you don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Because as an entrepreneur, you thought the cool thing to do was to only learn one thing, which is how to build a business, Yeah. right? But the cool thing is how to build a life. So those are the reasons why we don't do it. So good, yeah. Absolutely. Now, if I can go two different directions, I think I want to go towards the piece of you own multiple companies, yeah. right? Um, what are some of those behind the scene things that you do behind the curtain that nobody talks about in business that allows you to achieve what you're, you're able to achieve in your companies? What would those things be? So there are many things. And so it, it, you might have to further this question in which context do you want the answer? So, for example, from a business point of view, I focus a lot more on the customer and their victories than marketing, hmm. which is counter to what most people do. Yeah, most tell me people more. spend more time on their marketing efforts. I put a lot more time in my product efforts, if I may. My product is so much more significantly better at a price that works so much better for my audience because I understand them and I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it for results for my clients that I have a greater set of people that retain with me as a student. Yes. When somebody does one program with me, they're more likely to do three or four programs with me. Yes. I have, I've, I've started teaching about four years ago myself. Previously, it was for other people that I would design programs, right? They were on my businesses. And, and so they would get the testimonials. But now when I started training about four years ago, the last four years, I have 2,800 written case studies in just four years, wow. right? And that's because my effort is about how do I create a great success story versus how do I make a buck more, right? 
So what happens when you approach business like that is the first two years may be hard, maybe even three might be hard because you're not really generating a lot of profit because you're generating goodwill. You're generating thank yous. You're generating noise in the ambience that you're disrupting the environment because for once people go, hold on, this person actually says what he does and does what he says, right? It's just not a promise. It's actually he fulfills it or they fulfill it if it's a business. And when that happens three years later, it becomes a cascading effect. It becomes a, a, a compounding effect where suddenly you become the most dominant noise in the market and then you start making money, right? So the first three years don't look like a lot of success, but because I can hold it for the next first three years, because I can say, okay, I don't need to take a bunch of cash home in the first three years. I'm not trying to cash grab. My approach to business is different than most businesses. I'm not trying to find the next hook. I'm not trying to find the next story. I'm trying to find something that works. And because I'm trying to find something that works, eventually I do find it. And when I do find it, it can be scaled. It also means that a lot of times my way of advertising is different. My way of marketing is different. My frequency of changing things is much lesser. So one of the counter things that again, it, it's again, I don't know who's listening to this particular podcast, but if you are from the internet marketing world, you would hear a lot about optimization. I, I don't optimize anything. And that's counter to most people's belief. People go, what the fuck do you mean? <laughs> you don't optimize anything, right? I don't optimize anything. I systemize it to a certain degree. And then after that, I don't care if I get a 1% boost. I care for if I can create a new product because my system is strong. Right? So it's a completely different way of running a business right? because I'm not running for a little bit of impact. I'm running for a significant impact. And that's why our companies tend to be larger, faster. It's not because um, I'm the best teacher of all. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is my intention is different than most teachers. My intention is different than more entrepreneurs and, and, and business owners. My intention is not to build a small company. My intention is to build a company that does eight figures in about seven years. Right. So yeah. because of that intention, my my actions are different. Right. So you're really pouring into your client base and working on the retention of those clients versus constantly having the churn on the on the front end of bringing people in and them, you know, leaving and you trying to make the conversions higher and everything else based on just maybe doing a whole bunch of ads and such. But you're really focusing more on the fulfillment side and that no, I'm product and such. You're still doing both. OK. Churn is natural. Churn is normal. What tends to happen, and again, it really depends from entrepreneur to entrepreneur, but this is what I've seen most entrepreneurs do. Most entrepreneurs go, oh, I'm getting a, a lead for eight bucks, let's say. I'm going to try and get it for seven. I don't care if I'm, it's cost me eight bucks. I'm going to still get the client at eight bucks. And I would have that regular churn too. It's not like I don't churn customers. I do too. Even if you're the best in the market, you will churn customers. That's just that's just business, right? But there's a there's an acceptable percentage that you go, there's an acceptable percentage that I'm gonna be okay and comfortable with. So I am net, net positive on my advertising campaigns. I'm not making the most bucks out of it. I'm not making the least bucks out of it. I'm just net normal or net positive or net zero on the front end. And then post that because my products are better or tend to be better, I will have more retention on the back end. And my capability to build better products is faster. So I can build a product and roll it out in about three months. Most yeah. people can't do that, but that's because of my systems, right? Because I focus on the systems. And once you've built the system, then I can, I can iron out a product and deliver it in about three to four months at best. And right. because of that, my frequency of product goes up and my ability to re-enroll becomes higher because I have more products on the deck, but they are strategic. They're not just random PDFs that people think are products. They're not products. So when you're thinking about putting this suite together and you're thinking about adding in a new product, what is it that you're looking at? What's the problem that I get to solve for my clients that they will want to solve next? Next, yeah. Yeah, okay. so, and sometimes next doesn't mean deeper. Sometimes it actually is parallel, right? So, and it's very important to understand what's your client actually wants. Right. What they tell you what they want is very different than what they actually want. Say, for example, and this is a, this is this is this is where Evercoach became so successful so fast. 
from any standard, right? In seven years, we were we, we did 20 plus million in sales every year. So it's not accumulated. It's the yearly sales were 20 million, which is multiple eight figures. And, and that's why we got to merge with a large company like Mind Valley, because that's why they got interested in that. Otherwise, a small company is not interesting to them. Right. So, so anyways, with, with that point of view, the reason why we were distinguished, the reason why we grew so fast is because we didn't sell coaches products that told them how to make money. We don't. And that's what is the most common thing that a coach training company sells. Yeah. It's like saying, oh, you know what? People just want to make money. Let's teach them how to make money, right? Yeah. That's not what they want. If you really sit down and talk to somebody who's interested and is a coach, is a real coach, not somebody who aspires to be a coach, but a coach, somebody who really is actually not just interested, but invested, if I may show that distinction. Interested is I'm browsing the internet. Today I'm interested in coaching. Tomorrow I'm interested in Bitcoin, right? That's an interested person. They're interested in whatever comes at them. They're not actually interested in anything, right? A person that's invested is saying, okay, I'm going to actually do something about this thing because it's such a calling for me. So coaching or training or education or whatever business you're in is a calling. You love it. You would invest in it because you love it enough that you really want to get good at it, right? If you really ask a coach, a coach that has invested in it, they don't care about making money. Making money is actually really easy for an actual coach. It's actually incredibly easy. The people that you meet that can't make money are not coaches. Mm. The people who have read an article on coaching, let's say to really, really dumb it down. Yeah. They're not actually coaches. They've never actually taken a program. They've not actually practiced. They're good girlfriends or good boyfriends. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That's all they are. They're not coaches. Coaches take a program. Coaches learn. And when they learn, they also recognize that the number one thing they want to do is learn. Right, so what our program's only focused on getting coaches to become better at coaching. We never said make money through our program. We give those programs for free. They're like, oh, you wanna make money, you need a system, here you go. You don't have to pay anything for it. And that was the big dis differentiation. And that's what I mean when I say, you need to really understand your customer, not superficially, not what everybody else is doing. That's the wrong way to do business is what everybody is doing. The right way to do business, if you want to build a successful long-term company, is to sit with and actually talk to a real client. And when you talk to a real client, a real customer that you want to serve, you'll realize their needs on surface is different than their real needs. Their real, real needs for a coaching industry, for a coaching market, is not about building a business. It's not. Those are for enthusiasts, people who change industries every year. Whatever's hot, that's their new industry. They're never really building a business. They're building an offer, hmm. right? They're building an offer that will get them paid right now. And then they'll move to the next one. Yeah. They're not building a business. People who are coaches want to stay in the business. So they want to get really good at it. And so you're adding tools to the tool belt of their expertise, Becoming not really necessarily good at how to get the business, exactly. you know, a 5X return or something like that, right? No, I don't even talk about 5X return. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's not the main like, important thing. It's mm -hmm. not even the important thing. Because that's not what they that, that's not what their heart of heart interest is. A lot so of them we, are wildly successful themselves already. They don't even need the money. Okay, okay. So you're when you were realizing this and and setting up Evercoach, you like would just do some market research and asking your current clients questions of like why are you doing this and what is next for you and what are you wanting to learn and things of that nature. I would sit down with a coach and talk to them. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't doing online service. We did those too. But what I found most useful is when I sat down with coaches and I really asked them, what is what is really block? What's exciting for you? What are you learning right now? Mm -hmm. Most of the times I found they're reading books because there were no programs at that time that made coaches better. We were the kind of pioneers. They were there, but they were like super tiny hiding. So nobody could really find where these programs were. We were the pioneers of it when we actually started doing it because we realized that there is no one place they can go to learn. The only place they could go was ICF conferences, which mm -hmm. again, not to be down on them, but super simple stuff, not depth. There was not depth in it. There was no uh, years and years, 20, 30 years of testing out stuff and giving cutting edge education. That was not there. So we brought that to the forum because we realized that's what they actually want to learn. They're bored out of business trainings. They can make six figures without making any effort. Coaching is one of the simplest businesses to start and make money in if you don't listen to the online bullshit. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So speaking of the online pieces, how are you reaching your audience now in order to make this impact that you're making? 
Well, now we have we have a lot of we have so many engines firing because once you get to eight figures and multiple eight figures, you're not looking at one way to interact with audience. We we have a podcast, we have a YouTube channel, we have content strategy play, we have events that we do, that we have online advertising that we do, we do master classes, we do live events, live virtual events, I mean. It's a gamut of things. There's no one fixed way. Like we just finished like about a month ago, less than a month ago, about three weeks ago, we just finished our online event, which had 5,000 live virtual attendees, 55,000 signups, 5,000 concurrent, which means 5,000 at any time. So maybe 20, 25,000 people in total attended. Um, and we had about 600 people live with us. So, so it was a significant event for, for the coaching space. Yeah. Um, and, and that was just one of the things that we did. But we do these things pretty consistently, I would say every month. So it, it's, uh, it's many different ways we engage our audience in now. And when you first started Evercoach, what were you mainly using? Uh, we started with ads. That was the first thing that we did, yeah. 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 yeah, for our programs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Interesting to see the progression um, throughout the years on where it's taken you. Um, so, if I could wrap back around to one of the beginning statements you talked about, uh, the woman asking mm -hmm. you, "Who are you?" Mm -hmm. If you were to respond to that today, what would you say? Huh? Who am I? So answer changes every couple of days now. That's one realization I had is who am I is an ever evolving human being. And so there's no consistent answer that can, I can give to it. But what I can say for now is I'm somebody who, uh, who's in love with his wife, who loves hanging out with his children, uh, somebody who loves traveling the world, somebody who loves his friends and business partners and his parents, that I'm somebody who always leads with love and service that I am somebody who is always mindful of his health and well-being, and I'm somebody who would always, always do the work so I can collect more thank yous. So that's kind of what's present to me right now. I love it. I love it. And it it shows up in everything that you do. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up. What is the best way for people to reach out to you to learn about the programs you're doing and I believe you have a book as well. Would you mind sharing a little yes, bit about that? Absolutely. So a few years ago, I wrote a book called Live Big. I bought the rights back for the book so I can give it away because I think it's a really valuable book. And ever since I've started to do that, I've been getting more and more emails on how grateful they are to be able to get access to this book. Uh, you can download it for free. I'm giving it away. Uh, you can go to downloadlivebig.com, downloadlivebig.com, and you can get a copy of the book for free there. Uh, to get the most updates from my life or my content, it will be at Real Coach Ajit on Instagram. Beautiful. Last question for you. What is a takeaway or a memorable note you'd like to leave our audience with today? Do it for love. Do it for love. Don't do it for money, do it for love. It's easier, it's better, it's more fulfilling and it will give you the money too, if that's what you want, but do it for love. Perfect. Thank you so much for being with us. And I wanna thank our audience for joining us on another episode of Creating Powerful Impact. I'm excited for you to take all of these lessons and these resources that you've learned here today, implement them and create even more impact in your world. Until next time, have an outstanding rest of your day. Thank you so much for listening to the Creating Powerful Impact podcast. If you are a successful coach, speaker, author, or thought leader who would like to be on this program, simply visit creatingpowerfulimpact.com forward slash guest. If you are someone who got something out of this interview, would you please do me a favor and share this episode on social media? Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on your socials. Also, if you know somebody that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag creating powerful impact. I love seeing all of your posts and great guest selections. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content to make sure you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and they really mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more about us? Head on over to our website, graceandeaseproductions.com or follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. 
Just look for Grace and Ease Productions on your favorite platform. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.